take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. hands. God's divinely inspired word. And I'm going to hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Take your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 13, please, this morning. I want to kind of pick up where I left off talking about the parables of Jesus. This morning, we want to consider a parable that Jesus gave in verse 44 and verse 45 of Matthew 13. Actually, These are two parables that are meant to be given together that speak to us of a very, very important truth. Let me ask you a question. What is the most valuable thing that you have? You don't have to answer that. What is the most valuable thing to you? And what Jesus is going to talk about here is something that is incredibly valuable, something exceedingly precious, something that we should have want to obtain if you're not already a part of it. Now, let me just tell you again, what is a parable? A parable actually comes from a Greek word, which it's really two words, a combination, para, which means with or beside, we could say. We use this word in our English language all the time. We talk about a paragraph. These are two writings that are side by side, or a paralegal, uh, someone who comes beside a lawyer, and so on. And then the other word is Bale, which means to cast down. So you put the two words together and you cast down alongside is the idea. And what is Jesus doing when he tells a parable? He is casting down alongside a spiritual truth, an earthly story. He puts this story down alongside a spiritual truth in order for us to be able to understand it. Now, Jesus, who was the greatest teacher, a master teacher, taught some of the greatest spiritual lessons and just a masterful way by using these parables. And Jesus is going to give us a parable here about how to obtain, or we could say the obtaining of the kingdom. He gave parables about opposition to the kingdom when he gave the parable of the, uh, the uh, wheats and the tares, the operation of the kingdom, the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven. It starts out small, but it'll grow big in the end. He gave the parable of the uh, outcome of the kingdom, the dragnet. But here, this is with reference to the obtaining of the kingdom. Look in chapter 13 and look down at verse number 44 and verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field, that which when a man hath found it, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. And so the theme of these two parables is really about the supreme value of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has overwhelming value and worth everything that a person has. And really the question that these parables is designed to answer is, how does one enter into the kingdom? How can one be a part of this kingdom? that is so exceedingly valuable. So I want to just give you really two parts. I want to talk about the parables, and then I want to talk about the principles that we learn from it. So let's look at the parables. First of all, look at the parable of the hidden treasure. What do we see here? It's very simple. Uh, Here's a man. He's working in a field, and he finds a treasure. Now, the parable does not say why he was in the field. It may be that he was in the field because he was employed by the owner to work there in the field. He was probably plowing a field, and while he's plowing, he finds a treasure buried there. But when he finds the treasure, he he sells everything he has in order to purchase this treasure. Now, in those days, it was not unusual to find something buried in a field. You might remember the parable of the talents, where the Lord Jesus talked about one man who, rather than investing his talent, he buried it in a field. And that shows us that it wasn't uncommon. The story shows us that there were some people that, rather than invest their money, would rather just bury their money to hide it. So burying one's valuables was common. 
in these days. You know, today we, we put our money in a bank, we put it in a savings and loan or a stocks, but in those days they didn't have such options. Only the rich really had access to banks. So if someone had something that was very valuable and they wanted to keep it, they would hide it, they would bury it. And this was especially true in Palestine in an area that was so filled with battles and war. In order to keep a conqueror from taking your valuables, people would take them to the field and bury them with the intent of later on going back and recovering their valuables. You know, the archaeologists have found uh, jars of gold and coins, precious jewels, boxes filled with valuable things as they were doing their excavating. And so you could say that the earth in this particular region was a storehouse for valuables. And it wasn't uncommon at that time for a person who was plowing or digging in a field to inadvertently come across a treasure that had been put there, perhaps forgotten. And so this is what happens here in this story. This man is working in the field and suddenly he stumbles upon this treasure and he's filled with joy. I guess so. You ever meet someone who just won the lottery? Someone who just won Reader's Digest sweepstakes? He just struck it rich? Now, he does something that is unusual to us. When he finds the treasure in the field, he doesn't just snatch it up and take it. What does the Bible says that he does with it in verse 44? He hideth it. That is, he covers it back up, and then he goes and he sells everything that he has to buy that field. Now, the question is, was this legal? Was it legal to do what this man did? Shouldn't the treasure belong to the owner of the field. Someone would think, you know, if you find something in a field that doesn't belong to you, normally the owner of the field, that would be theirs. And this would probably be the question that people ask when they come across a parable like this. How could Jesus tell the story of a man who does something wrong here? But what you have to understand is that there was a Jewish rabbinical law that said this. Let me just quote the law. If a man finds scattered fruit, scattered money, these belong to the finder. It's a good law, isn't it? We thought finders, keepers was our idea. This goes all the way back to Jewish rabbinical law. This was not only Jewish law, this was Roman law as well. And because the man who found the treasure was within the bounds of Jewish rabbinical law, the people listening to the parable, by the way, they would understand this. They would get it. They were to, would perceive the man's actions to be right and not unethical. The treasure that was hidden in the field didn't belong to the man who owned the field. So it was whoever found it. If it belonged to the man who owned the field, then surely he wouldn't sell the field before he recovered his own treasure. He didn't know it was there. Apparently it belonged to maybe the previous owner or someone who buried it there and then just forgot it. And the man really was very fair. In fact, the parable shows us that he went out of his way to do what was right. If he was not an honest man, he could have just taken the treasure and ran. But he didn't do that. Or perhaps he could have taken just a portion of that treasure, liquidated it, and then used that money to buy the field. But he didn't do that. That would have been wrong as well. Instead, what does he do? It's even though he knew that Jewish law gave him the right to claim the treasure, he didn't use any of it to, to purchase the field. What he did was he sold everything that he had to buy that field. Here was a poor peasant farmer, and he had to sell everything in order to buy the field. But he knew that was the right way. That was the legitimate way to get this treasure. The man did not do anything unethical. He did not defraud anyone. But here's the whole point of the parable. The point is, he found something so exceedingly valuable, something so supremely valuable, that he did everything he could to legally obtain that thing that was so valuable. That's the whole point. Now let's go on to the next parable, because they're linked. Look at verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. And you notice the word again in verse 45, which again kind of links these parables together. And again, the, 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 the theme is something incredibly valuable. This time, the central character is a jewel merchant. He's not a poor farmer. 
He's the opposite. He, he's a man who has wealth. The word merchant here has the idea of someone who could really buy and sell for his own personal gain. And basically, he, was, he would buy and then sell in order to make money. And many people believe it was these merchants, even more than the military, that conquered the world of Rome back then. And so in this parable here, he's a man who is seeking pearls. This is something he's been looking for. This is what he invests in. We would prob probably compare today someone who invests in gold in the stock market and puts all of their, their money in gold. He, he's putting all of his money in pearls. And uh, this was common for men to do at this day. Pearls uh, in that day were equivalent to diamonds today. They were just incredibly expensive. And one Jewish scholar said that they were worth millions of dollars, even in that day. And really what they would do is sometimes in that day, they would, they would do some pearl hunting, which is really incredible when you think about it. They didn't have the diving equipment that we have today. They didn't have the scuba gear that we have today. So what a man would do is he would, he would tie rocks to himself and go down into the sea. And, and he would hold his breath. Hopefully his lungs wouldn't burst while he's looking for pearls down there. A lot of people die doing this. But they did this because these pearls were so valuable. They were exceedingly precious to the people. Remember Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Because they were so very valuable. Don't give something valuable to someone who would not appreciate it. And so in this parable, here's a jewel merchant. He went around seeking fine pearls and selling them to retailers. But what happens here is that he finds a pearl that is so valuable. And he sells everything. Now, this guy is not poor. He's rich. But this pearl is so valuable that he sells everything he has to purchase just this one pearl. Think about that. You know, they tell you, diversify your investments. He, he violates every financial law here because this pearl is so valuable that he sells everything to get it, to make it his. Now, that's the parables. Number two, let me talk to you about the principles. What do we learn from this? What is Jesus trying to tell us? What I want to give you just quickly, just six lessons. First of all, here's the first one. I've already said it. The kingdom is extremely valuable. You see, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, what does that represent? It represents the kingdom. It rep represents being a part of the kingdom of God. And, it's so, and it, the kingdom is so immeasurably valuable. Again, those who invest tell you don't invest in one thing, but... Here, this is exactly what both of these men do. They see something so incredibly valuable that they invest everything they have into this one thing to be a part of this kingdom. Why? Because being a part of the kingdom is so priceless. It is so valuable. You know, I, I'm proud to be an American. I'm a flag-waving American. It's just, I, I never appreciate it more than when I'm in other countries. I thank God that I'm an American. I thank God that I was born in America. And there are certain privileges that come with being a citizen of the United States. But let me just tell you this, dear friend. America, as much as I love it, is going to go the way of the rest of the earth. There's only one kingdom that's going to last forever. And that's the kingdom of God. And those who are a part of the kingdom of God are a part of something that is eternal. It is so valuable. And so we see here that this, these men, they see that to be a part of this kingdom is worth everything. What if these men saw this treasure and rather than get the treasure, they just walk away from it and they say, ah, you know, it's not worth it to me. Just forget it. That would be foolish. But friend, that's precisely what people do every day. When they're shown the kingdom of God, there are many people that just walk away from it because they don't see the incredible value of being a part of that kingdom. They don't see what a treasure it is. And sometimes I'll be out and I'll be witnessing to others and trying to tell them about eternal life. And they'll be so focused on the here and now. They'll be concerned about insuring their house and all their valuables from loss. And they're so focused on the here and the now that they forget what is really valuable. What is really worth everything that we have. 
the kingdom of God. Someone who's been made alive in God, they see it. If you're, if you're a true child of God, you see how valuable it is to be a part of this kingdom. Psalm 84 verse 10 says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I'm a part of this wonderful kingdom. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 16, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many of the wicked. And when a person gets saved, they have changed their values. Whereas before they looked on this temporal world as being valuable, now they see that the kingdom of God is what's really valuable. So here's the first lesson that we learn. The kingdom of God is incredibly valuable. It's like the hymn that we sing. Sometimes I've discovered the way of gladness. The hymn writer said it like this. I found the pearl of greatest price Eternal life so fair, t'was through the Savior's sacrifice I found that jewel rare. The eternal value of salvation outstrips the value of anything in this world. But here's the second lesson. The kingdom of God is extremely valuable. But here's another lesson. The kingdom of God is externally hidden. It's externally hidden because you'll notice in both of these parables that there's a sense in which the treasure was hidden. And we see the word hidden there, crypto, uh, where we get the word cryptic. Uh, it, 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 was, it was hidden. It's, it's beneath the surface. In order for you to really get it, you have to go beneath the surface. It must be dug up. You have to, it, the pearl is beneath the water. The treasure is, is in the earth. And neither parable is the treasure on the surface. And there's a sense in which the kingdom of God is somewhat hidden from the world. In the same way, the value of salvation is not apparent to men. And I've told you this before. That's why those who don't know the Lord Jesus, those who are not saved, they don't understand us Christians. You know why? Because their eyes have not been opened to see the value of the kingdom. They don't see the incredible value of knowing Jesus. They don't understand why we would give our lives to Christ. They don't understand why a person would go to the foreign field and serve sacrificially for the Lord, the preaching of the cross to them that perish, it's foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And Jesus said it. He said it to Nicodemus. Unless you're born again, you're not going to really see the kingdom of God. You're not going to perceive the value of the kingdom. You're not going to see how great it is. But here, these two men, they had their eyes opened. They saw the value of it. So much so that they're willing to dig or dive or do whatever they need to do to be a part of this kingdom. Their eyes were open. But here's the third lesson. The kingdom is extremely valuable. The kingdom is externally hidden. But here's another one. The kingdom is explicitly personal. Because what I want you to see now is that in each of these parables, the individual seeking the kingdom is an individual that obtains it. The idea is that people come into the kingdom on a case-by-case -case basis. You come individually. I can't obtain the kingdom for you. I can't obtain the kingdom for my children. The kingdom has to be obtained on a personal level. It is individually received. You say, why is that important? Well, remember that Jesus, who is he speaking to with this parable in this audience? He's speaking to Jews. And many of the Jews had this mindset that just because they were children of Abraham, that they were a part of the kingdom of God. In fact, there was a common tradition that Abraham sat at the gate of hell to keep out all Jews regardless of their deeds. They said he sat there at the gate of hell. He would not allow any Jew to go into hell. And there were many that thought like that in Jesus' day, that just because they were a child of Abraham, that they were going to heaven, that they were part of the kingdom and by the way, there are some people that may have that idea even today. There are some people that believe that just because they grew up in a religious home, or perhaps their parents were religious people, or they're just part of a church, that you automatically go to heaven. Because of who you are, maybe who your family is. And I tell my children all the time, look, you know, just because you grow up in the home of a pastor doesn't mean that you're automatically going to heaven. I tell them all the time, you better make sure of your own salvation. 
It's dangerous to think that your association with spiritual things and spiritual truth, that alone is enough. It's not enough. You have to make sure. No one gets in automatically. That is the gist of these parables. You don't automatically get into the kingdom just because of who you are, just because of who your parents are. And as you notice in this parable, there really we see two ways that an individual discovers the kingdom. One person, he just stumbled upon it. He wasn't necessarily looking for it. He was just doing his job. And one day out there in the field, plowing, he came upon this treasure. It was surprising. He wasn't looking for it, but he found it. And he sold all he had to get it. And that describes to me some people the way that in the manner in which they're saved. And it might be some here today. You weren't looking for salvation, but salvation found you. God found you. You stumbled upon it, you see. And then we see the other man, he was searching for it. He was looking for it. And this reminds me of some people that they're looking for something. They're longing for something beneath the surface, something that they know that they don't have. And they want peace and they want real lasting joy, but they're not exactly sure where to find it. And finally, it's revealed to you. Reminds me of Cornelius in the book of Acts. Reminds me of Lydia, the seller of purple. There's something in them that wanted something from God. They weren't sure what it was. And finally, they were able to see this pearl of great price. And when they saw it, they were willing to give up all that they had, that they might be a part of it. There are some that stumble upon it. There are some that look for it. But when they see it, they see the value of it. Here's the fourth lesson. The kingdom is, ext is extremely valuable, externally hidden, explicitly personal, but fourthly, the kingdom is eagerly entered. There's another common element in these parables. You know what it is? There was eagerness to obtain it. Once they saw it, they were eager to get it. This reminds me of, of uh, when Jesus was speaking to the Jews. Look, look at Matthew chapter 11 real quick. Look at verse 16. He's, he's talking to the Jewish people, and it's because they have their, of their negative response to the kingdom. And look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 16. Notice what he says. He says, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? He's talking about the generation of Jews that were privileged to hear him speak, to hear John the Baptist preach. Jesus said, what's this generation like? In verse 16. It is like unto children sitting in the markets, calling unto their fellows, and saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced we have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. What is Jesus saying there? He's, he's giving really a, a story here. We could say this is really a parable as well, that one characteristic of the Jews of that generation is they were like spoiled children. You ever meet a spoiled child? We all have. What's one of the characteristics of spoiled children? They don't really understand the privileges they have. They don't really understand all the blessings they have. And Jesus is saying this about this generation. They're like children in the marketplace. And back in that day, children in the marketplace, sometimes they would play wedding. You know, you ever do that? They're playing wedding, and then there was always music with it that they would pretend to be doing. Or they would play funeral. And pretend there would be a pretend minister who would do the funeral. I would rather play wedding than funeral. But here these children were playing. And, and there were some that weren't participating. Jesus said, Look, you're like children in the, in the marketplace. And you play wedding and you say, I don't want to play. And you say, well, let's play funeral. You say, I don't want to play. Reminds me of the neighborhood I grew up in. We had one guy who was rich enough to own a football and if we tackled him too hard, he wouldn't let us play with his football anymore. He'd take his football and he would go home. And here are these spoiled children, Jesus says, and you don't want to play wedding, and you don't want to play funeral. And when John the Baptist came, you accused him of, of uh, you know, uh, being someone who was like a, a, a funeral, that he came neither drinking, and you said he had a devil, and then when the Son of Man came, you accused him of being a friend of sinners, of being a glutton and a wine-bibber. 
There's nothing that can please you. You don't really understand the value of what you have. You don't understand that the kingdom is right here. And you can enter the kingdom right now, but you don't see it. Because you're so blind and you're so spoiled. But however, some did. Look at Matthew 11. Look at verse number 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What is he saying here? The kingdom of God is violently moving forward, and some people are forcibly entering it. In other words, there were a group of people who did understand what was happening, and when they saw their opportunity to be a part of the kingdom, they were pushing to get in. You ever, you ever hear about these reports around Christmas time when Walmart has a special? And these people line up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And when the door is open, there's a stampede. And someone gets trounced by people. By the way, I will never get up 2 in the morning to buy anything. But they're there, they're waiting. And then when the door is open, they, they trample over each other to get in because obviously there's something in there so valuable to them that they got to get that's the sense of this verse here. Jesus was saying, there are some people that when they heard John the Baptist and they heard me, they understood how exceedingly valuable the kingdom was and they were entering into it. They were pushing to get into it. You know what I don't see today? I don't see that today. I don't see people seeing how valuable the kingdom is and pushing to get into it. Normally, there are people pushing to leave church if I preach over 12, which I've already done. Pushing to get into the restaurant before the Presbyterians get there. <laughs> it's all a matter of what's important to you. There's no one pushing to get into the kingdom. You know why I think part of that is? Is because we have so many different gospels that are being preached nowadays. And many of them are not. They're not there's only one real gospel. But what we've done is we've trimmed the gospel to make it acceptable and palatable. And if you don't like the gospel here, which we preach the true gospel here, friend, you can always go somewhere else and find a gospel that is more pleasing to you. The only problem is you're not going to get into the kingdom if you don't have the right gospel. So we don't have people pushing into the kingdom anymore. At least not the way it happened in John the Baptist's day. But Jesus was saying those who really see the kingdom, they understand the value of it. They're eager to be a part of it. Let me give you the fifth thing quickly. The kingdom is extremely valuable, externally hidden, explicitly personal, personal, eagerly entered. Number five, the kingdom is exceedingly joyful. We saw that in verse 44, that when you become part of the kingdom, there's great joy that a person has. And that's where true joy comes, friend. The heart is we're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever-Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.